that you're always in in battle between what can be done versus maintaining your theory and architecture, right? Like a big example of this is, is, is what Brian is doing. Like you'll see, he asked me this question many times. He said to me, hey, where does the hub you know, land. Is it a broker? Is it a service? You know, is it an exposure layer? What is, where does this land according to this theory, right? Because very, very soon, once you start letting go of the theory and start kind of creating, you'll see people creating utilities, creating common libraries and, you know, creating uh, middleware and commands and, you know, all these kind of nice things, you know, all before you know it, you know, your system just doesn't make any sense. You know, you just don't understand what the system is really doing. And and that's basically the point, right? So, um, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, uh, somehow we maintain this structure even while while working with uh, uh, some nice technologies like uh, like uh, Blazor and I, I keep forgetting the name. Is it Signal R? Yeah, Signal mm-hmm. R Hub. So, so Brian... Why, why don't we start with you? You know, let's just get started. You know, can you show me the, you know, I know you have a repository out there mm-hmm. and that basically like really seamlessly just communicating messages between two, two different web applications. Uh, yeah. What does, yeah, go ahead. So what I did what I did there was um, I just took the tutorial that MSDN, MSDN has on their website and I just, um, basically I didn't want to go too far away from what they did because I didn't want to make code too hard for other people to digest other than people that are that are standard aware if you get what i mean yeah so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as soon as you go down and start breaking things right apart they everyone sort of starts rolling their eyes unless they're you know they're they're familiar with the structure so okay i'm gonna share, okay. my, I'm gonna share my screen the... all right anyway. I'm going to choose which one. Let me get the right one. Okay, you're flexing. You have many screens. We get it. You're rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not this one. You just opened up a portal into another dimension. <laughs> go, go ahead, right. There we go. Um, so this is the uh, repo I posted in um, uh, Discord earlier today. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So I'll just um, fire that up and just show you how it works real quick. I don't think there's a real need to do demos with you guys, but. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's taking a while. Yeah, okay. So that is just basically the tuto- the end of the tutorial, uh, and I've added in that little one little step. All right. So uh, I'll just duplicate that tab. So we've got two. So yeah, as uh, soon as he started spinning up uh, things, the audience started to grow. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Don't... Hello, Rhi. Hey, Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right. Why well, everyone okay, so... here has a funny accent except for me? <laughs> <laughs> Just got... Did you have Go a ahead. funny accent? <laughs> I have to tell you something this time. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, Brian. <laughs> so, okay. so this is just basically the standard tutorial. It's um, just, you know, I've got two pages here. Uh, what I'm hitting here is coming up over here. Um, but, nice, nice. Yep. But what I did is, um, I'll just slide this over here for a second so I get out of the way. On the server, we have a typical sort of hub. Okay. Right. Yep, but the only thing I do a little bit different is it's a typed hub. It's just an option when you create a hub. Um, it allows you to uh, strongly type the receiving uh, methods on the client. Brian, do you mind zooming in a little bit, please? Uh, okay. Um, Thank control. You. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, yeah cool. much no, better. It's getting all of it. Yeah. His eyes aren't what they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I lost yes, I lost Yes. It. <laughs> sorry, guys. I, um, I thought we are just doing the full screen stuff today. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um. Yeah, so uh, it lost. So, yeah, so this just strongly typed. So what strongly typed means is um, I can just set up an interface and define whatever methods I have on the client. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so that's how it knows that I have a message called receive message, uh, a, a, a method called receive message. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so here I create a broker that basically encapsulates what we call a hub context. Now. A signal right. hub. A signal hub is actually made up of two objects. Uh-huh. There's a hub context and a hub mm-hmm. caller context. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a broker around the hub context, not because you don't have access to the caller. Right. Okay. Right. So the caller can be passed in from an exposure layer service, and this can be injected into the exposure layer service. Does that make sense? Yep. So, so, so this, so this caller is. So from your page, from your web page, okay, let me try to understand this, Brian. You, 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 you know, this is this is too advanced for me. You have mm -hmm. a you have a page, you have a component, and this component is sending a message, right? I'm mm -hmm. assuming you have a broker downstream that's leveraging that broker is the hub context broker. Did I get that right? Yeah. So in this particular solution, the one we're looking at at the moment, I don't have it. It's actually going straight um, into the broker. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, from the controller. Yeah. yeah, so it's actually not even using the broker here. I'm not injecting the broker at all. So this is the first demo. Okay. Let me switch over to another branch. This might be better. Okay. Oh, Brian, we lost you. He hung up the whole thing. How are you doing, Christo? Paul, while Brian is back to us. <laughs> he, he ran, you know what happened? He ran the application on the same instance that's running uh, uh, StreamYard. So when he shut down his application, it took down the entire Chrome instance. <laughs> That's what happened. I hate it when VS does that. I, you know, you know yeah. this ha this exact same thing happened with me on Channel Nine. I was literally, <laughs> hey Brian, <laughs> was, was Streamyard running on the same instance that you're running the uh, ASP.NET Core? <laughs> <laughs> As soon as I killed the debug, it just did what went all dead. <laughs> that, thanks, David Fowler. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man, let's go back to this. <laughs> I forget where I was now. Oh, whoa. Well. <laughs> so, 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 Brian, just the possibility here is amazing. The fact that you can just kind of communicate events all the way upstream across distributed systems. So you have an API and you have two clients you know, mm -hmm. listening in and you're basically propagating and publishing that event back and forth. You're sending a message, it's going through Hub, it's going right back mm -hmm. to the next client. How I'm visualizing this, just to give people who are watching, because the stuff that we're doing here is pretty advanced. Like I can't kind of bring someone up to speed with something like this, you know, without giving them a massive introduction about, you know, uh, what's happening. So, so Brian, help me understand here. If I go up in here and I basically say, so what you did is you have an API and this API is sitting here and this API has signal R. So I'm going to put in signal R up here. So this is signal R, right? And then you have two, two portals, two customers, right? Logged in and one of them is sending an event mm -hmm. and the other is basically receiving that event and propagating the message. In yes. simple terms, this is exactly what you're doing, right? No, no, no. Actually, in this particular case, the events pro uh, start from the server. Okay, okay. okay. So, the, so from but the, the events, server from here. The, uh -huh, the, event, uh -huh. the event has actually been triggered by a call to the um, controller. Okay, okay. Let me, I got, I've got, can you, I've shared my screen again. I don't know if you can. Yep, yep, yep. I got it. There it is. Yep. yep. Um, let me go to the controller. So on this controller here, I'm, um, you'll see I'm injecting an event service. Mm -hmm. Yep. And when I, the somebody hits this controller here for a get on the weather forecast, it's calling mm -hmm. my service. Uh, notify controller action? What is this? This is a method I wrote? Yeah. Okay, um, and which basically calls, talks to that broker that I showed you and um, mm -hmm. sends it, yep. So, so Brian, let me tell you this. Ideally, ideally, we want to be able to go and say, you know, we, we could use Hub, we could use Signal R, you know, at some point, but we what we want to do is that we want to kind of hook up like this topic that this meeting is about specifically, you know, in addition to eventing through uh, mm -hmm. Signal R, we want to hook up this localized events with something upstream. And this is where, where I'm going to be asking, you know, uh, 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 Christo and Paul, you know, a bunch of questions. 
you know, so, so, so don't get too comfortable, guys. We're coming in next. But here's, I'm going to take your screen for a second, Brian, just to show people what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, ideally, what we want to do, assume that you have an event broker, event broker sitting in some enterprise application. And this event broker has a bunch of consumers. So you have a service that's listening and a service that's publishing. Or it could mm -hmm. be multiple for, for all I care, right? And then this is propagating all the way upstream to some UI or some customer. So this is your mm -hmm. portal in here, right? And is it possible that we can have um, the hub, event hub, sit in the middle here? to kind of propagate and communicate these events. Let's say this is, let's say this is message uh, service, right? Message service in here. And this here is message event service, right? So someone somewhere, maybe an orchestration service sitting up in here between two other services that basically went and said, you know, an event has happened, go persist this in a database like this. So let's say this is message uh, uh, persistence service, right? And then you have here message orchestration service. Or even better, let's call this message service. And let's, let's say this message notification service. Okay? So someone, somewhere, right? It could be a system, it could be a person, it could be anything, right? A client of some kind, right? basically went in and said here's an event that needs to happen we went and persisted that event in the database and then we went and said oh go ahead and populate that event publish that event this listener is listening up in here can we actually use this pattern of yours to bring that all the way up through the portal this way from yes. the bottom up okay yeah okay. um i i don't can't really show you the code at the moment but remember the demonstration yeah. i showed you for the remote bind yep we're on your yeah. code right now yep 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 i i remember yeah. the remote bind yep 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 yeah yep. and that's exactly doing doing exactly that it's propagating an event from this client up through the server and, and receiving on the another client but okay. it's actually the server is actually uh, oblivious to those ones it's actually using a very clever trick um to it's using um json to encrypt not encrypt to um serialize whatever object i want to send through the hub because the nice. hub was, the hub is only handling a string <clears throat> nice nice now i, I, uh, I want to show yeah. one more thing here guys um go i just ahead. want to run this run this particular demo go ahead because it's got an extra little feature in it i i, I really want to show off about <laughs> Brian wants to, Brian wants to flex. He wants, you know, in New York City they say floss. He wants to floss a little. <laughs> All right. It's probably yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna lose me thing again when I stop. <laughs> okay, don't. Okay, try try not to lose us this time. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So I'll leave it running. <laughs> so this particular time I'm gonna um duplicate me tab. Hang one over here. Can we see the both the screens? Already? Oh, I saw this. Watch this. Watch this yeah. magic. Okay. So um, I'm going to um, just um, call this off Brian. And... So at the moment, um, I'm sending a message through and I'm hitting the API and nothing's happening. Okay. But now I'm going to hit uh, monitor the API. Oh, oops, over here, I'm going to hit monitor the API. And when I hit the API. Oh. Now that's done with using channels or groups, uh, mm. signal R grouping. Okay, so when I hit that button on that screen, uh, uh, I nearly did it. <laughs> well, 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 you monitor. <laughs> you're you're still here though, Brian. That's a good thing. I closed one window. I didn't close the second one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, on my page, um, let's just have a quick. That button is. Uh, on, it's just hitting this uh, monitor here, mm -hmm. which is coming down, and all it's doing is basically telling it to subscribe to a channel, which is a, basically uh, an alias for just using a signal art group. Mm -hmm. Now, here I'm actually subscribing to a channel, one particular channel for the mm -hmm. for, for that particular controller, so it's segregating all these messages, so I can subscribe to any you know a myriad of different channels depending on what the channel what, what we want to monitor. Okay. And what we want to keep separate, we could have um, 
uh, we could have channels that are basically for the different roles. You know, there's stuff that um, admins might be able to see and you don't want um, normal people to see sort of thing. Nice. Nice. It would be nice to add security on this. We'll see what that looks like. You know, yeah. maybe 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 certain certain roles and certain things that can allow you. If it's a controller, it's a controller, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Like I can put a role on a controller and you don't have an access to that controller endpoint except unless you have that role. You know, yeah, I can do this. Right. I can do the same with the signal R hubs. So nice, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I... so, okay. So Brian, this is one portion. Does anyone here have any questions for Brian before I jump over to Christo? Because we need to, we need to kind of discuss the pros and cons of doing events on primitive operations. But back to this. Any questions here? Can can this be set up such that the messages can use some sort of queuing? mechanism so if, for example a message is sent and then the system goes down it then gets received when the system comes back up uh, like a service bus implementation would do now i know that signal r has um back planes which allows uh, so let's say you've got um an application that's running in azure app service and you're running multiple deployment slots so you've got say 10 copies of your application actually running in the cloud uh-huh because it's being hit with heavy load or whatever, um, uh -huh. you can have a situation where, for example, an API call comes in, it raises nine events, mm -hmm. you know, so all 10 servers handle a piece of that initial request. Mm -hmm. um, potentially with something like backplanes, I know you can connect across processes. But I guess my issue is around the, the consistency. So one of the big things that I often get asked about is deployments whenever i do a deployment at the moment um if we don't have multiple instances of things the, the service literally comes down during the time the service is being deployed um but if you can set up some kind of persistence for that then oh you, that's lovely yeah you actually um so one of the jokes that me and callum were having the other day was like imagine if we could start um a large data load, um, an import process during a deployment uh -huh. and it imports some of the data. The system goes down, but it goes down in a staged fashion and continues importing data whilst the system's being updated. Because that is literally yep. the holy grail of applications, right? Yeah. Then you could effectively have zero downtime. Yeah, And for us, that's the sort of feature that we're kind of looking to achieve. And I think SignalR can do it, but I don't know about like how backplanes work and things like that. But yeah, so, for me, it feels like something you could build a library or we could build a, a standard compliant library. Yeah. And then have that perform all the magic. And then we can expose some API from that library that could just make everything to do with eventing happening happen. right and it wouldn't matter if it was internal to the current process or across multiple <laughs> services right right sorry i feel like that was a lot to digest no but, no 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 yeah. that, no this is this is lovely the question for brian is brian is this is this a thing that can happen like how do you know do you, okay two questions from what paul just said by the way paul this is this is crazy i love this um brian is the do you know when your customer has received a signal R message? No, you don't. Uh, 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 but, but you could, re but you could write code to make it uh, acknowledge. Of course, this is it. So my understanding uh. is that there's two ways of doing service bus type messaging. Mm -hmm. You can have like, um, so you have a message go in, and you can mm -hmm. say, right, all subscribers get the message. Mm -hmm. Or you can have a message go in and you can say it's round robin. So one subscriber gets the message and, and handles it. So it depends on the kind of subscription that you've got. So in my case, for example, thinking about like transactions, right? Mm -hmm. I've got mm -hmm. different child collections of rows that I mm -hmm. need to raise events for and other things need to deal with inserting those. Mm -hmm. So I might raise one event that says, hey, an invoice is being imported but mm -hmm. then all of the handlers need to handle a piece of that event mm -hmm. essentially in my case um so in that but that's how i'm wiring up internally 
Now, imagine yeah. if I had multiple instances of my application running. What I might want to say is, well, internally, when I'm handling an event, I want all of the pieces to be handled, but externally across the system, I don't care if pieces are handled on different physical servers. And this is where things start to get really complicated. And, it, and this is the sort of architecture that really loses people. So mm -hmm. to my mind, this is something that I think SignalR can solve and can massively simplify, but we have to be very careful about how we approach it. But we also need to, if you like, make sure that we're taking all these complicated scenarios into consideration, but do them in a simple way. <laughs> yep, simplify them. Make it. That's the hardest part. What do you think, Brian? Um, you, uh, there's nothing out of the box that I know of that can sort of do that sort of thing. But I, I can't see why we couldn't wire something like that up pretty easily. To be honest, um, on the server side, you could manage some sort of um, queuing mechanism that tracks the um, the individual clients and send messages to the relevant client at the relevant time. Uh, yeah. One of, one of the craziest scenarios is fanning out. I usually just tell people, oh, go use event grid or something, right? But implementing and kind of adapting that takes a lot of work. I, I have a I have a session queued up to talk just about that part. Um, Paul, you were going to say something? Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's, it, it's that thing there that, like, if we can implement something that effectively solves the problem, you're talking about competing with those kinds of technologies and end service bus, biz talk, you know, those kinds of things. Whereas actually to my mind, I'm, I'm not interested in competing with them. I'm interested in demystifying the problem because you're there simplifying. are a few areas. Yeah. yeah th mm. There's a few areas in modern times in, in modern applications that we build that are just considered black magic. Right. Yep. So one of them mm. is like GPU physics and what the hell goes on in there. <laughs> right. Um, well, yeah, one of them is is networking, funnily enough, and solving the general problem of networking, usually at the hardware level as well. So network wizards are just, you know, yep. black magic. And then the other one is this. And and I'm thinking, look, if there's different ways that we can configure things and we can build a simple API that's wrapped around a technology like SignalR, because I'm, I'm fairly confident that SignalR can handle it, but what we might have to do is bolt SignalR to something else. Uh -huh. What I'd like to do, though, is solve it in such a way that I can pull a NuGet package and I don't have to go and deploy like 50 other things into my yep. infrastructure. I just deploy my applications and my applications kind of communicate yep. and the infrastructure itself just kind of handles it internally without the need for me to go and like set up, I don't know, like a service bus queue or something. Yeah. You know, if yeah. I can have queuing just happen internally and it's like a distributed memory cache or something within my processes right right that would be awesome because if you think about like service plan if you've got 10 slots open the yep. way that deployments are going to happen they're going to bring them down one at a time and replace the version of the, the application that's running right so yeah it, it, these are all just like areas that i've been thinking about a lot lately um specifically regarding scaling issues as well you know when you start getting to that point where you want like hundreds of thousands of requests happening you know, in parallel or whatever, and you, you want to really like hammer an application to handle global levels of traffic. Right. Um, but you don't actually want to care when you do your deployments. You just want to do them when you know you've got stuff right. Yep. You just want to, you want a plug and play model. You know, you want to worry yeah. about what your application is actually doing rather than these, like, I always tell people like when you're, when you're developing a system, there is a portion of your code is just the same as any other application you're doing out there. There is no difference. Infrastructure is infrastructure, app service, is app service, database is database. You know, the, the beautiful engineering experience here is to shift your focus from worrying about that and focusing your engineering on the actual application, the stuff that makes your app different from anybody else's app. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that means that, you know, the engineering tools are actually helping you focus on the things that matter the most. Okay. It is, it's funny when I spend more time when I speak to like Azure support asking why they've recommended a particular piece of technology and how that helps me in my C sharp environment solve my problem. And they go, Oh, we don't know, but this is the thing that you're supposed to use for it. And I'm like, well, give me a NuGet package. That would help. 
<laughs> and they're like, that's your domain. And I'm like, oh, okay, fair Here enough. it is, but in .NET framework. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> let, let, let's shift this a little bit. There was a discussion that we had last time, you know, this last session, we were talking about uh, a proposal that Christo has for uh, kind of, we need we need to go back to this poll and we need to talk about this because this could change a lot of things. The proposal here simply is to go and say, if you have, Paul, I know you build things, you know, you know, bottom up. I don't know why you, you know, you do that, but you know, for me, it's a, it seems that you, you understand, just flip the screen, just flip your screen. Everything will be fine. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, so <laughs> just, just flip your screen and, and everything will be okay. <laughs> so, so what, what, what Christo is proposing here, right. And this is something I need. I need everyone's brain on this because this could change uh, how we kind of think about call sack and how we implement this. Did you actually flip the screen? Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is this this is how I know Paul is an actual software engineer. If you tell him go to the to the market and get a couple of bananas, he's gonna go get exactly two bananas. That's that's all he's gonna come up with. So, oh, yeah. so. Be specific. <laughs> <laughs> What was what was the old joke about eggs and milk? Get, <laughs> get, get half a dozen eggs if they've got milk. Get two. So he comes back with two eggs. Or oh something. yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said if they have half a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paul. All right. You know, never ceases to surprise me. You, you'll always do that. But here's here, here's the proposal. This is basically what Christo is proposing. He's saying, why do we need to have two different things to propagate events when I can just make my foundation service the source of that event? So minimize the architecture or optimize your architecture from having an orchestration service that persists the message and then go back again and send an event for anybody listening to that event you know, to kind of go and subscribe to it. So this event is basically pub sub, and then you have another orchestration service sitting up in here to kind of listen on to that event, and then basically push more or do more with this event. This here is the current model. This this model here in blue, that's the current model. We're basically going and saying, if you want to do eventing, you know, you're going to have to do something and then this something will be published as an event and then someone else is going to be subscribed to that very exact same and paul this is how pretty much your uh your your current uh, standardized system is working right you basically went and said i want to subscribe to these events i'm going to build orchestration services listening in where i can persist that here's what christo's saying christo's saying no i don't want to do that i want the same service that is executing the event to be the also the exact same service that is it, paul was just sharing this as i'm going to share this with you guys in a second but christo is saying i want this guy to be the emitter of the events so this will look something like this you will have maybe levant maybe you know a a customized implemented model that basically goes and says if you want to listen in to a service that's persisting students or messages or whatever the case may be you should call where i like the idea that we should listen in to where the event has happened so if i'm adding a student this is where i should go to listen in to see if a student has been persisted in the database which basically changes this model into this particular model here this whole thing would turn into this so you would be you would have some some orchestration service listening in to this message service and the message service will go call whatever other foundation service you know to do whatever it wants with it maybe it wants to persist it maybe it wants to do whatever it wants with it so this is this is the actual this is the most critical topic although that i think the you know the hub stuff is actually pretty cool so Here's my concern with this. This guy is going to become really, really fat. It's going to have a lot of stuff in it. That's one concern. Second of all, now you have integration with two different entity brokers. So these are not utility brokers. These are very specific entity brokers. 
I'll let kind of Chris to kind of walk us through this and talk a little bit about it, and then Chris, did I take did I say everything? Did I take your your proposal away? What what do you have? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I'll go ahead. quickly share my screen as well as yeah, um, just ahead. to yes, please do. Um, get to the, the the diagram that I had. Guys, I need your brains on this. I just go as go as crazy as you want. This is a very important piece. Go ahead. So, so I, I started um, playing with the cool desk pattern after you did the the, um, the one at scale. Yeah. Um, and what didn't feel right for me was raising the event um, upstream. So, yeah. um, what I did is I, I, I made a change because this uh, student event broker and the uh, storage brokers are the same level. Mm -hmm. I made that a dis dependency of the student service. So when when a change happened on the student service, like add or update or delete, mm -hmm. I push, uh, published that to, to the event broker. And that, that felt good for me because that is where the action happened. It wasn't going up the event service to come down orchestration to get published in, in the student event service. Mm -hmm. So it, it felt more right for me to, 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 to publish the event where it happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why I f uh, f followed that pattern there. And it also means that for me, if if the student uh, uh, service becomes a dependency somewhere else, mm -hmm. I don't have to remember to push it through orchestration service, then back into a student's uh, event service again, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. then you're duplicating your work because you've already used your um, three two, three two. rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so so this is a safer option for me personally, um, and it also means that uh, somebody um, getting to the project later doesn't have to have necessarily the event logic and, and remember to, to implement upstream things if, if they change something on the student service or, or something else gets swapped out to 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 um, to cater for that event. Um, I don't have a problem with um, the student event service uh, listening and pushing that to orchestration to handle the events that that, that is that is fine by me but I, um, I, I did feel it was nicer for me to to um, uh, publish the event where it happened. And um, I think the other problem, as you said, uh, the uh, event uh, broker is not a utility broker, but it would be nice if we get a solution where uh, orchestration service, for instance, can announce, I I've done my job. Yeah. Without yeah. having to maybe traverse down through a processing service and then a, a student, uh, another event service to, to persist that. So. It's it's a bit of a, a, a difficult one because it, it it is not a utility broker, but it is the main aware. Um, right. So so the student service will be subscribe. So so it will have two dependencies: student storage broker and student event broker. And yeah. then when a new so so it's going from the top to the bottom. So you're pushing in a student through the student controller. It goes through the student service. You persist the record, and then you you announce the event. And then yeah. whatever else is listening to this from the other side, you know they may either propagate upstream. So let me ask you this: What if the library account service wants to listen in on the student event broker? Would you allow the library account service to listen in on the student event broker? So so for that, I still followed the the pattern that you did in the cool desk. Yeah. Um, you, you've got your student event service that that exposed that um, published event to the mm -hmm. um, library orchestration service, and that that orchestrates it to the things that needs it. So mm -hmm. I think I'm I'm quite happy with that mm -hmm. um, because you will need some sort of orchestration to act act on an event. I don't want um, the foundation service to to, to um, be actors on events as well because, as you say, that will make it bloated. Um, okay. It'll give the foundation service, I think, uh, more responsibility that it needs. Um, okay. Whereas with uh, the, the publish of the event, it's just that one line to the um, student event broker to say, this change has happened and, and, and here's my object. All right. I have I have a couple of other questions, but I'm going to wait for people to kind of chime in and see. I, I think there is something there, you know. Uh, where the event should happen is where you should listen to that event. I like this a lot. Um, but uh, that's I, where you publish it. Right. Your, your, your listening is still um, at the uh, student event service. Right. 
So you but, you you publish your chains and your uh, every subscriber will still or, or your orchestrations will uh, subscribe then to 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 to. Um, so question. Yeah. So logging would be considered a support broker function, right? Yeah, it's a utility broker. It's not specific to any entity yet. Right, because anything can log something. Literally, you can. So utility brokers don't even abide by. I can only be broker like I can be only with broker neighboring services. You can use a utility broker and orchestrations processing. You can use it any layer because they're utilities. You know, they're utility broker. You're basically calling logging at the orchestration service to log certain okay. things. That's okay, right? Okay, so yeah. to my mind, events are much the same. I okay. can have basic CRUD events in a foundation, uh -huh. or I can have um, complex orchestration events occur from an orchestration service. Okay. So for me to say, for example, um, so when I'm doing bulk data loading, right? I'm right. taking large blobs of CSV data. Right. And I first parse all that data and then create individual CSV line items in the database. So I could raise an event for each individual line item. Right. And I group them by reference to get um, the set that's represented that makes up a single transaction. So I could raise an event to say, hey, I've received a new transaction set's worth of data. Uh -huh. And then I could raise another event to say, actually, I've um, processed receiving um, the entire file. Right. And so, so to my mind, like events are not just basic crud. Mm -hmm. Events are more complicated than that. True. And so because they can be raised anywhere, I think that it is a support broker function to raise an event. Now, okay. subscribing to events, I've set an internal sort of, just for consistency reasons, I've set an, uh, a sort of internal pattern where I say you can only handle an event generally from an orchestration service because mm -hmm. then that requires you to have some dependency on mm -hmm. something that's going to um, give you that event notification, um, plus also the regular processing um service that sits underneath that so to my mind you're going to have at least two dependencies there and i try right. to keep my colder stacks as as clean and well you've seen my diagrams right. yep. try yep. to keep them artistic if you yep. like yep that's that's really really important to help people understand it but paul th this is a very strong argument like you can raise events from anywhere right yeah. you should you ought to be able to raise events from air that's extremely so, strong go ahead what go about ahead. the what about the idea of a instead of a utility broker a utility service that's because, that's that's what i was going with like yeah. you, well, bro ahead, brokers don't one. contain any code anyway right so there's yeah. always going to be a service sat behind that broker so mm. if you have an event broker you're ultimately you're going to have an event, you have to have service. An event service yeah <laughs> yeah to actually implement the functionality the broker is just basically your um if you like your separation, it's your yeah, integration contract. layer. Yeah. So the way that I've yeah. done it, um, well, I say I, we've done it internally, um, is what we did was we created a separate library um, mm -hmm. which contained standard compliant sets of services for mm -hmm. eventing. Mm -hmm. And then we created an event broker. Paul, um, Paul do you want to share your, your architecture with, the, with folks so they can see what you're saying? yeah sure uh, christo christo you don't have to unshare because i can switch between shared screens because we can okay. come back to this one yes go ahead paul uh, so yeah uh, sorry bear with me no worries while so, paul is doing that oh that, yeah. that was the, the old one with the shared uh, yep yep Okay, so are you guys ready for this? This is going to be huge. This is how is enterprise applications working. Check this out. So, um, obviously, you guys have all kind of seen this diagram. It's, it's yep. massive, right? Yep. So what essentially happens is um, an event comes in uh, in the form of like a HTTP request. In fact, mm -hmm. what I've done is I've ripped out um, a piece of it here. So this is a piece of that larger diagram. Mm-hmm. 
So what will happen is I'll receive some random, you know, CSV data or whatever that comes in and it will go down. And then as it stands at the moment, mm -hmm. what we have is something that's more like the traditional cold de sacking model, which is like yeah. this. So what we do is we have some T controller where, mm -hmm. you know, a T or a collection of T's or something is given to it. Um, we do some standard, you know, processing uh, orchestration or whatever on that and then what happens then is the orchestration service then says hey i'm notifying of an event and goes down yep. its own cul-de-sac chain yep. now i guess what we were com sort of trying to understand is is this whole stack here really necessary mm -hmm. because it, the forking at the orchestration level here and the need for that extra stack is essentially not necessary if we're okay with potentially drawing a line from our foundation into our hub essentially mm -hmm. um even if it is necessarily via a event broker like this mm -hmm. if we can do this then we don't need this essentially in order to, for us to be able to subscribe to our events up here in the uh well well yeah well, well now you have two problems your orchestrations is now talking directly to a broker. Now, given your argument that a broker is a utility broker, right, which I'm gonna yeah. come back to, here's the thing. The other thing about utility brokers is that they're not specific to any business. Your event brokers are specific to your business. Are they mm. though? Like, so that there's, there's generic eventing, which is like the stuff that Brian was talking about with um, using SignalR. Mm -hmm. And like the general concept of having a backplane or service bus or something that can just generically handle messaging, mm -hmm. I think is a very common function, no different to something that can generically handle logging. Um, but the specific events that get raised and how they get handled, mm -hmm. you could argue that you might need some specific code for that. But then right. that code lives in both the thing that's raising the event and the thing that's handling the event. Right. That thing that's raising the event. See, this is exactly what we're doing with storage brokers. And storage brokers, you're basically going and saying, yeah, I know Entity Framework can handle any entity, but we are making it more concrete and simplified to handle students, teachers, classes, courses, libraries, and all that. You're doing you're going to have to do the exact same thing with an event broker. You have to go and say, listen specifically to student events, listen specifically to teacher events. Right. And in that case, now you lost your utility status. Now you can't copy that code the same way you copy logging broker code and put it in any other application out there. Right. What do you say to that? Um, I think that given that the the act of doing this and the, the way that we've written this event service is mm -hmm. uh, we've got a single foundation service. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I think it's a processing service because we added some extra functionality on there with a foundation underneath it and okay. its own broker. Mm -hmm. So eventing has its own broker anyway, which can handle storing the event subscriptions. And then the event service can basically say, hey, you give me some, some kind of um, function, some async function, um, and give me the name for the event, which is just a string, yeah. and I'll wire that up in my internal, if you like, dictionary that's, yeah. that's storing this stuff. Um, and that's all I need. So it is a very like generic thing. The, the thing that I'm kind of really getting at here is the thing that's actually holding and the event subscription information and the actual um the trigger if you like that kicks yeah. it off yeah um is basically just a for each loop right because you're going to look up the thing oh uh, an event's been raised okay i'll find that key in the dictionary and then from mm -hmm. that key for each handler that i've got i'm going to async await the function that has been configured you, what you I can... don't need to do uh -huh. as that component is understand what that event is, how it works, what's needed to be done, uh -huh. because all of that logic is actually in my standard compliance services, in my regular cul-de-sac code. So in those listen to events methods that we have, mm -hmm. I actually have the code, and that is then properly unit tested and checked. Right. So from an eventing point of view, it's... It's kind of like internally in the eventing library, 
I don't need right. to know anything other than how to call an async function. So beyond so, that. <laughs> so so wait, wait. So now if you're doing iteration, that means you started to do business logic. That doesn't belong in a broker. Do I agree on that? Because Correct. you need to test it. You need to Correct. somehow okay. But it's so not if, in a broker. It's in a service. Okay, so it's in a service. Behind now. the broker. <laughs> okay, now bear with me. So yeah. if it's in a service and you have an orchestration service that's talking to processing services, how are you going to inject that service? Your your architecture will be imbalanced. So from the point of view of the orchestration service, mm. it's no, again, this is why I bring up the point about logging, right? Right. So behind a logging broker, mm -hmm. if we're following the standard properly, there should be some sort of logging service that decides how to write log statements out that are given to it. So there's always going to be behind a broker some kind of object. The broker is not the end of it. So like in the way that like if we have a broker that wraps up um, some kind of external API, uh -huh. behind that broker there is effectively, say, a HTTP client. Right. And then that goes off to something else. So the right. broker isn't the end of the chain. Behind a broker, there is always the thing that you're integrating with. So right. what I'm saying is, hey, I've written this other library. Yeah. And I'm going to, in my application code, I'm going to expose and I'm going to connect up this support broker. Mm -hmm. And behind that support broker is whatever's going on in that library, which is an external dependency right. that I've written to the standard. So now I've got something else that I don't need to understand, but it's going to handle this problem for me. But it's I consider it a generic problem in the same way that I consider logging a generic problem. Okay. Does that so, make sense? <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 so let me tell you a couple of things. First of all, these uh, logging brokers, they have the ability to take whatever you give it and serialize it and just log it. So you don't actually need to have a specific contract. The contract is known by the service itself. Just the way we throw an exception, you know, yeah. to, and I think Christo is working on something on tracing that plays the exact same tune, right? He's basically going and saying, you know, I, I want a dummy logging broker that I give it whatever object and you do the serialization. The serialization happens internally in a subsystem behind the, 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 the logging broker that we're working with. There is no need there for... Uh, what, what do I get back when I raise an event? What do you get back when you raise an event? Yeah. You, you, don't, you don't have to get back anything. Like you're basically going and there saying... Go. Here, Here's so, some stuff. So, so, go so, raise so, an event. I don't care how you do it. So so, 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 so so that's one case, but there's also another case where you raise an event and you want to know whoever is listening on the other side, what they have to say about it, assuming that it's a one-to-one -one relationship, right? That's not something we discussed, but it's something that right. this is the fire and observe versus fire, fire and forget. So right? this is why I find Brian's proposal really interesting, because what I can do is I can potentially have some service in my cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. that wraps up an event broker, mm -hmm. which is some kind of, um, let's say for argument's sake, it's a reference to a signal R hub that's behind that in the actual service that's behind the broker. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I can have another event client broker. Mm -hmm. And those two can be dependencies of my service. So then I can be both the publisher and the subscriber. So I can have a two-way communication because what will happen is I will raise an event, some message will go off, and then I'll get a message back later saying, hey, I've accepted your thing. I've done what you asked me to do. Okay. This is one of your questions to Brian. And Brian said exactly, you can do it that way. I, and I, this is what I'm suggesting we build. I, I, can't, <laughs> I, I can't go head to head with Brian in anything, just so you know. But, uh, you know. Good, don't. <laughs> Okay. Okay. What do you guys think? Okay. So this is Paul. This is his two cents. What do you guys have to say? I've actually been kicking around this similar idea to Paul's for a little while and um, as a utility sort of broker service. And mm -hmm. so not only that for messaging, also for um, handling security. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Because, because you need to sort of bring something like that into... Um, uh, all sorts of all different levels yeah, when it comes to security. 
That's true. We want there's there should be actually another topic where we kind of talk about security per service, like security at the service layer. Yeah. Um, l let me let me bring this back to Cristo then. So Cristo, what Paul is saying, let's have a generic event service, and everyone kind of listens to it. Anyone can leverage it, you know, in a way. If if I understood this correctly, Paul, what do you think about that? Um, it will definitely allow us to raise the event uh, then in, directly in the orchestration. So so that that'll um, make it a little bit easier for us there. Um, if if we I create, I, uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, I th I, th I think it, it it can work and simplify things for us. Um, I think we we must just. Uh, uh, yeah, we've just seen a use case for security as well, and I think you mentioned yesterday about caching. So if we can get a similar pattern for all these things, then um, it, it can work for for a lot of things. There's there's another concern that just came to mind about you know building an event service. You know, if you let everyone talk to this generic event service, now you've created entanglement. Now everybody's stuck to this one service, mm -hmm. right? And now you're stuck with everybody kind of piled up on this one non uh non entity specific service that's kind of propagating events what are you going to do with that anything like a... I've, I've got an idea sorry i actually actually wanted to wait to see what chris has uh okay, what ahead. idea he had but if you think about it um in the standard it, it's like there's two there's two things to it right it's where what's the direction of your of what you're referencing or depending on and how does the data flow between yeah. those things like through yeah. your through your dependency and your exposure right right but now let's think about this if if we say we don't always fail or, or we don't always need to favor you know um data goes one way like you 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 like let's say for instance you have orchestrations or you have a student service right mm -hmm. so with the normal crowd operations mm -hmm. okay you, you're either posting a student updating a student or getting a student why can't we have another kind of interaction with that foundation service that says inform me when a certain thing has happened certain mm -hmm. something has happened if if let's say because now you can have an orchestration service or mm -hmm. you, you, you will have your foundation service to, to post the student, but mm -hmm. you'll have another orchestration service to listen to that same foundation service. But this is now your orchestration student library service, you know, orchestration service. Right. So right. The, the, the reference always stays towards a specific instead of having one event service, you still have your normal references to your foundation services but you now add this extra functionality of notify me about certain things happening in your world so and 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 interestingly enough i'm not sure if we could use signal all as well because now you can say okay because i'm in the student domain mm -hmm. throw all the events on the student uh, channel or what what group signal or group or whatever mm -hmm. So now you have an orchestration service register just register to those to that same foundation student everything is there everything is enclosed everything about a student is still in that same domain it's not you know all over the place i'm not sure if that no 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 i see what you're makes saying sense, but yeah I'd, I'd even go to a step further and even break it down into um uh like i've i sometimes track not just the uh, controller i track the actual entities themselves mm. Mm. and, and um, you can create a channel for the, the ID of the entity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. And, and you can also create channels for um, different uh, actions like um, mm -hmm. gets and deletes and stuff like that. So, so you might, um, uh, so when on a CRUD level, there's things that affect the whole list and there's things that only affect the item. Right. So, you don't want to be listening uh, to the wrong thing because you'll have a whole lot of traffic in a channel that you don't need. Right. And you're, yeah, and you're like, so, 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 okay. So 
there are it seems it seems like there are two things here okay let me just you know bring the conversation back to this so Christo, how do you feel? So you're saying, okay, have a student event, but also in the student service itself, allow it to talk to the event broker and send the student down there to that broker and then have whatever is listening to it is listening to it, whether you want it to be a, a student event service or, or other. Paul is saying make it generic. What do you have to say about that? He's quite. Oh, oh you're yeah. on mute. You're on mute, brother. Um, I quite like the name events, but ge generic would also not bother me. Um, uh, so, sorry, it's to, nice to, to know. Clear, if you, hmm? To be clear, I'm saying have eventing in general as a generic function, but I right. I do I support the idea fully of like if there's student events, you have like a student channel, and only things that are interested in student events subscribe to that channel. Right. But the, the hub, the wider thing that is responsible for eventing will be aware of more than one channel. Hmm. If that makes yeah, sense. like as so a utility would, broker, basically. Yeah. yeah. So you're still you're still keeping within the confines and sort of expectations of the standard because mm -hmm. maybe we can wire these things up in such a way that we can say, hey, you only have access to certain events in certain conditions, such as we meet an entity requirement or something or entity types or something like that. I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know if I can buy that an event broker is is a utility broker. But if we can solve this argument, then we, there's nothing to, to there's nothing to discuss when it comes to uh, Christo's proposal that a a uh, a foundation service that's doing persistence and storage is also publishing to uh, an event. I'm a bit concerned about calling that a utility broker because you're not going to be able to copy that and put it in any other application. Mm. You just won't, you know. Yeah. So, so, the, so the only thing that you don't get there is the um, uh, publishing of events from orchestration. But I think orchestration will have the uh, event service anyway mm -hmm. attached to it. So, so that's not that big a problem for me. For me, it was just to raise the event at the right place. Um, and certainly for CRUD operations, that was directly where the CRUD happened. Um, okay, then, Christo, what do you do with exceptions? Now you're going to have to handle two completely different types of exceptions for two different dependencies, right? By the way, just before someone comes up and says, oh, well, how come you don't handle exceptions from the logging broker? That's that's something that we're researching. But I'm talking about your happy path scenario where you are talking to a storage and persisting in storage, but you're going and talking to also an event broker. That event broker is going to throw exceptions too, right? What are we going to do then, right? So now you're like, like the structure itself is telling you, it's trying to tell you, hey, dude, you're doing two different things and you're handling two different categories of exceptions that the same way an orchestration service would. Like an yeah. orchestration mm -hmm. service would be handling student validation exception and a teacher validation exception right mm -hmm. you'll be doing something very similar to that on the student level what do you do what do you say to that um i think for the uh, in memory events it's 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 it's, it's, it's simpl more simplified than than with the um, external events right I, um I, I think the external events is more more complicated mm -hmm. but um, it, it's almost like the internal stuff has is, is, is got direct access to the event when it happens. There is, there is, I, I don't think we've we've done any eventing in the cool desk um, right. demos or something like that. But in terms of handling those events, I would would have just surfaced that as a as, as a dependency error on on this um, student service. Okay. So 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 yes, it, it might be event related, but um, it's a, a dependency similar to a storage dependency or any other dependency, uh, external dependency that, that you might have. Um, I think with the um, local events, anyway, if, you, if, you, if you're not on the happy path, um, you, you, you're going to hit your exceptions before you raise your event anyway. It'll be something strange that happens on your, on your local events mm -hmm. to, to, to break your process. So it's like... <laughs> 
are, are you trying to say that you want exceptions that happen in event handlers to propagate back through from the caller that raised the event? No, when you're when you're publishing the event, Paul. If you're publishing the event and your broker is throwing an exception for whatever reason, right? It works. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, sure. be, it, it becomes then its own. Uh -huh. How is that any different to like talking to a database? And that raises an exception. That that's the thing. When you're talking to a database, you're recognizing and acknowledging that this is an entity broker, and therefore, if the exception is raised, we're gonna handle it, we're gonna wrap it up, and we're gonna claim it as ours. Right now, when you are talking to a storage broker and an event broker, now you're getting two different categories of exceptions on a foundation service that is not supposed to be doing that level of orchestration. As far as as far as like the current status quo, you know, based on Christo's so, proposal, we're thinking about shaking things up. Go ahead. So if I'm in a, a student foundation service mm -hmm. and, a, and I attempt to add a new student mm -hmm. and it fails because either the event couldn't be raised that the student was added or it couldn't go in the database. Mm -hmm. Either way, there's a failure there, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to further up the chain somewhere. I'm going to catch that exception and do something with it. Does it matter what kind of exception it is? Probably, depending on the, the business case here. But as long as you are able to be made aware of it and mm -hmm. make that decision as the programmer upstream, I'm I'm kind of a bit confused as to what so what the issue is. Yeah. So 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 let let, let me try this. Let's say your foundation service is supposed to be primitive operations. It doesn't do anything other than that. It wraps up whatever your broker is offering with a little bit of validation on top. That's it. Right? If you start having your foundation service going and saying no, in addition to this primitive operation, I'm going to do another primitive operation which is publishing an event. Okay, publishing that event raises its own set of exceptions, right? So now you're going and saying, in addition to failed st uh, student storage exception, now you have mm -hmm. failed student event publishing exception. Now you run into another crazy scenario where you go and say, wait a second, I can't roll back now because I'm a foundation service. I'm only supposed to wrap up existing primitive operations. So now you're in this situation where you're going and saying, what if my persistence in storage succeeded, but publishing the event failed? What are you going to do then? At the orchestration service layer, I can go and say, wait a second, here's a failure. Let me roll back, you know, systematically roll back now again back to the foundation so it's going to get fatter and fatter because now you have more things that you're adding into that foundation service i mean back to crystal's point i'd love the idea that where the event happens this is where we should be listening to but how can we implement this in a simple way that doesn't compromise you know your architecture but also at the same time keeps your foundation service simple simple like pick up Callum, for instance, you know, he's a new guy on your team. He's been around for about two, three years. Tell him, hey, we're going to have our foundation service in addition to doing primitive operations, also going to do eventing. How does that yeah. feel? Right. Yeah. I mean, he's well, look at the model that we've got. On I, I mean, I mean, that. yeah, exactly. So we, we had extensive discussions about this and this is kind of like the sort of cleanest kind of model we could come up with and th this actually um the way that this is approached is that the invoice processing service in this case mm -hmm. um would be a dependency of all of the child elements that are going to handle those invoice events so mm -hmm. actually what we did was we took the event broker and it was although it was a dependency of the invoice service in that mm -hmm. the invoice service would be the thing to raise the event mm -hmm. we would be subscribing to it up here mm -hmm. so it would be exposed through the entire invoice stack that makes sense um, rather than treating it like a support broker in which case i could have took that single event broker and i could have injected it straight into the invoice line orchestration service and the invoice reference orchestration service directly right. without the need for going all the way up and down those that invoice stack so what i'm saying here is that i mm. think the way or the the spirit of the standard if you like is mm to treat things on a kind of per entity basis per entity. so you have yeah. this concept of clean contracts right so to my mind um invoice processing services for example are expected to be a little bit more involved than 
a foundation service. So I would expect at the orchestration level, when I'm subscribing to an event from a processing service, it may return more complex problems for me to deal with. Or pass through. Um, yeah, or pass through potentially. So, uh, but also what I'm actually subscribing to is an invoice processing service. So I either expect to get back information about invoices or, or something more advanced Higher invoice order. advance yeah invoice errors something to do with invoices so to my mind i was still sort of staying within kind of the spirit of what the standard is teaching us with the cul-de-sac pattern yeah. whilst allowing for this additional complexity to take place within that same vertical or horizontal if we draw them out the way you draw them out <laughs> right so, right <laughs> It, it's you... difficult because like like what I've got here, right, this entire diagram represents the data that, to my mind, is a single business document, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you think about what an invoice is, you've got a header, you've got some line items, you've got some references that have come from various places, you've got who's involved in it, so the companies, and then in our case, we've got where it lives in the system, which are the buckets, so all of this infrastructure here is just purely about getting from a CSV blob to a transaction, a full um, entity graph of a transaction in the system. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, yeah, there is some complexity about it. And that is just unavoidable. But yeah. how do we wrap the complexity up in such a way that the right things are in the right places? And right. To, to my mind, like the thing that deals with eventing is just calling handlers. It doesn't need to know what those handlers do. And the thing that raises an event just says, hey, this is my event name. Here's, here's the thing that is my argument that goes into my event, my invoice in this case. Mm -hmm. You know, you deal with it. And all the broker is going to do is it's going to say, well, I've got a list of handlers. I'm just going to call them. Right. And whatever happens, happens, right? But then... At that point, because I'm calling the handlers, what I'm actually calling are methods in my orchestration services. So my orchestration services are then saying, OK, I've got some invoice event that I have to handle. Well, mm -hmm. how am I going to handle that? What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick off the pieces that I'm interested in. I'm going to pull out the lines, for example, and mm -hmm. I'm going to process those. Now, I may raise my own in my own cul-de-sac, my own mm -hmm. problems, but I've received an invoice. Right. And that's all I'm doing when I subscribe to an event. I'm saying, hey, there's some source over here somewhere, and I'm interested in what goes on with it because I'm going to need to follow up. But, so but, once I've received that data, I can follow up, and then I can you know, potentially raise my own events. But by the way, just so you understand, like, what you're talking about isn't far off from where... I want to take uh, the standard, you know, in the next iteration. I talked to you before about uh, the lake house, right? So we talked a little bit about having a lake and then you have a bunch of services sitting up in here and these services doing their own processing. And this way it's, it's, it's beyond dependency injection. You're basically going and saying, you know, I'm only listening to certain events and other services the way Alan McKay, you know, the innovator of object oriented programming intended it to be right. It, mm -hmm. He basically went and said, you know, these objects are not supposed to know about each other. They're supposed to send messages to each other. Right. So exactly. <laughs> the model that you're talking about is basically all of these services kind of, you know, publishing. And then other services are subscribing from that model onwards, right? So you have yeah. these publishers and you have these sub subscribers, but that the way you're the way you're trying to make this happen by calling an event broker a utility broker is is a little problematic. I mean, I'm gonna have to kind of go and build something. When I say problematic, I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm saying problematic for me. I'm trying to understand, you know, what what's the implications on that? Like, what does that mean to someone who's trying to kind of build a, a standardized enterprise level system from day zero? How complex is that? Not knowing the context of discussions like these that we're talking about, right? Uh, if I go when, and... Uh, when, go ahead. When you set up, say, a SignalR backplane or a BizTalk server or a, an end service bus instance, mm. do any of those services actually understand 
what's in those messages? Or do they purely only understand messaging? I, I guess that's my point here. Is that, I, don't, I don't like this talk. <laughs> that's what I have to say. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, this is the parallel that I'm drawing here. We're talking about like potentially, you know, the simplest requirement is in-process messaging, right? Uh -huh. A A raises an event. B over here somewhere in the same process handles that event. Right. But in in the more complex scale of problems, if you build your library correct, uh -huh. you can say, hey, A is going to raise a thing. And somewhere, potentially even on another network, mm -hmm. B is going to handle it. Right. You know? And so that problem in itself is a complex system. And it doesn't need to of... be. But, but the way you're describing it this way, that's simple. Right. But what I'm basically saying is, OK, I want to put an entity in a database, right? Mm -hmm. A database server is a complex system. I don't give two how that database works <laughs> i'm going to give it some data i'm going to give the the framework like ef i'm going to give uh, that some data i'm going to say stick that in a database you do yep yep Fire and forget, Subsystems, right? yeah yeah and if you give me some exception back fine i'll catch it yeah. i'll handle it but i don't care what you do right you're, you're a separate system what i care about is what i do internally right right and i think eventing for me feels like it's kind of in much the same context as as that or even like logging you know like go, go log this event i don't care if it goes in a file i don't care if it goes to an email i don't care if it goes to a signal our hub and somebody subscribed to it mm -hmm. just log Here, here's a log statement do what you want with it you know and i think it's much the same with eventing right you can have events and in some cases you can say hey, I've got subscribers to this event. In other cases, you might just not have any subscribers, but you can raise the event and see what happens. So so let me tell you this. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to have this session to kind of, you know, listen in in depth about what people are thinking. You know, now, now this is the first time I hear about event brokers as utility brokers, not entity brokers. <laughs> um, le let me, let me what kind of... What would the entity be for you? Because that's the, the thing that's confusing me here. The, the contract. Your contract. The contract being what? The student, the teacher, the, you know, the email that you're sending, the... No. The th uh -huh. it's, it's a function. Right. I'm passing a string, my event name, and a function. Right. And the thing that I'm passing it to understands nothing about that function other than it's expected to be so async. So that that thing that you're calling a function, the event broker says, don't even worry about that. Just give me a thing that's went that's going to publish student event, and I will know exactly which functions I need to call to make this happen, which simplifies yes. the whole thing. You know, mm. if you if you play with strings and rely on strings to kind of identify your target event, that's hugely problematic, right? That's prone to error. I mean, they always there's someone always that comes in and say can say name of this dot student dot published student function anyway we are a little bit at time a little over time but you know let me let me kind of think about these i'm going to kind of you know uh, reach out to some of you on the discord channel to kind of ask more questions because this is a massive shift you guys like this is not a simple you know let's go out there and just you know uh change this this is not a library or how we parse strings or you know validate emails this is much much larger than that uh, I'll take a look at it. I, I want to say thank you all. I appreciate your, you know, amazing contributions, continuous contributions to the standard community. And, you know, um, even, you know, new new people like ATN, you know, coming in and people have been talking to me. If you guys haven't seen him, you know, kind of standardizing uh, gaming development, <laughs> you know, who would have thunk it, right? You know, <laughs> I was like, I was like, what's that all about? Right. Um, I, I appreciate your contributions in this matter. And then, uh, you know, let me, let me, kind of mull this around a little bit and think about it and ask a few questions and then we could have like a follow-up to this session to see uh how we can change things right uh, how we can evolve things or maybe this might be just the precursor for the lake house standard 3.0 who knows we'll see you might just get pissed me off enough you know to kind of go and say okay fine scrap all of this let's start He's over finally gonna do some work <laughs> 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 I'm a man. Yeah, I don't do there work. Was, there was one other idea that I had for this. <laughs> go ahead, um, go ahead. Because what we're basically talking about here is problems of scale, right? Yeah. Um, 
essentially the way you could treat event handling is mm -hmm. you wire up basically a, a second API call back into mm -hmm. the system. So you completely leave the system and then you rely on load balancing at the infrastructure level. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's scary that you're saying that because this Levent library that I just published, uh, th the third stage of it is supposed to have its own external API that pretends that there is an event coming from an, something called Cloud Foreign, which I'm just kind of preparing for because this is going to be like really heavy advanced content that I want to put out there on YouTube. Um, don't care about people saying my my content is boring. Deal with it, you know. Take it or leave it. You know, you know. I, I have my team playing my content in two x speed. That's how they they kind of get through with it's things. Not, it's but, not long uh, enough. We'll end for eight hours next time. Stop fast. Stop fast enough. <laughs> All right, listen, you know, I'll, I'll set up something else for us to kind of follow up on. I, I'd really love, and I was just talking to Christo about this the other day, I'd love to have like a standard community kind of sum, summon to kind of go and say every month, let's get, just get down together and talk about the, the most pressing issues. What's our agenda? What are we discussing next and all that? Because at this point in time, I mean, you have 300 engineers in our community, you know, and people ask me questions literally every day. So we should probably have like a like a monthly stand up where we go and say, okay, here's the state of the standard. Here's where we are. Here's how you can get to the uh, next level and how you can upgrade your enterprise systems. It's anyway, still a mess. it's, it's just shut, shut your front door. <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate you all. And, you know, of course, you know, people, you know, kind of watching this session, drop a comment, you know, if you have any questions and, you know, thank you all. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Take care. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>